I have the best presentation aid, the food, the cookies you just ate. But this, right here, eating together, is my whole point. When we eat with someone, we automatically form a stronger bond than simply meeting and talking does. I'd like to put this into the context of our culture in the US. We value individualism, the ability to choose our own path in life. But this individualism can create a sense of isolation if we take it too far. A product of this isolation is an increasing cultural malaise in the US, a feeling that something isn't quite right. To attempt to cure this, we look to the past and to primitive cultures, hoping to recapture some of the sense of being a part of a community. But the characteristic that recurs again and again as the difference between them and us is eating together. Anthropologists study food as the social cement that bonds groups together. Much anthropological research has been invested in showing how food exchanges develop and express bonds of solidarity and alliance, and how exchanges of food are parallel to exchanges of solidarity, and how commensality corresponds to social communality. Marcel Mauss, in his seminal work, The Gift, focuses on the idea of creating an economy that trades selves rather than just goods. By exchanging and sharing food, things become more personal and less material. This has been used as a framework for analyzing societies and their use of food consumption as a social bonding agent. For example, the Hua in Papua New Guinea are culturally prohibited from eating the food that they hunt or produce. Instead, they have to exchange it with their neighbors. This creates interdependence because they need each other not only for companionship, but to provide sustenance. This interdependence goes hand in hand with mutual obligation, for if you're going to receive food from someone, you need to give them food as well. All of this strengthens the community, creating stronger bonds between individuals and between individuals in the community. The Hua also believe that the nutrition in food is not a product so much of its innate properties, like the chemistry of it, but rather of the relationship between the person who made it and the person who eats it. If their relationship is amicable, the food will transfer strength and nourish the eater but it can equally make them weaker if there's any enmity or tension. This worldview acknowledges and stresses the importance of eating together as more than just a way of sustaining your body, but as a way of sustaining relationships. Two anthropologists, Beardsworth and Keel, quote others in describing this aspect of food. Exchanging food <coughs> is a token of social bonding and integral to all social interaction. This reciprocity, where I give you food and then you give me some in return, creates a stronger bond between us. Because food literally crosses the border between the individual and the external, entering your body from outside, it becomes a part of you. Thus, it symbolizes the outside, whatever that outside may be, becoming a part of you. So when we eat together, we physically ingest our relationship. For the Laoje, also in Papua New Guinea, the sharing of food encapsulates a moral code. For them, the concept of buying and selling food is contrary to the basic structure of social interactions. It's quite literally wrong for them to sell food to another Laoje, and they blame many of the world's problems on this commodification of something as vital as food. Now, what's interesting here is our reaction to these examples of people and societies sharing food. Most people feel some sort of nostalgia for these so-called primitive times where people were more interdependent and generous. We collectively yearn for a return to this mutuality where there really is a sense of community. Though we profess a desire for individualism and it is a good quality up to a point, we subconsciously realize that it's become isolation. The dividing point, eating together. We may each be individuals, individuals but we are individuals that are part of something larger, like so many individual points of color that together make an image. Though each little blob of paint can stand alone, it means so much more when it works together in an interdependent context. An especially timely example of this nostalgia is Thanksgiving. Every year, we gather together with family to eat a meal together. The whole holiday is an encapsulation of the power of eating together to create a community, especially in a family <laughs> setting. Traditionally, sharing, foods is sharing meals is how families were defined. Mary Douglas, in a famous case study describing meals in Western households, defined meals as for family, close friends, and honored guests. For her, food was the way families defined their members and who they were intimate with. 
Some families, and you may know families like this, eat every meal as a small, close-knit gr group, often just the nuclear family. But others have larger groups eat together, with, and they define the concept of family more loosely. But the concept conceptualization of a meal has changed dramatically in the recent past, which changes how we define who is in our family. It used to be that meals were restricted in their movement, usually eaten while sitting around a table like this family in the 1950s. Now, Americans, as often as not, eat standing up, either over the kitchen sink or on the go. We're usually multitasking, watching TV, working, or doing something else. But these simultaneous activities mean that people are less focused on the meal. The key to understanding this trend in our culture is differentiating between food and meals. The crucial difference is that meals are events. They're not just food. Meals require company. They are, by definition, eating in a structured format together. In the modern US, we're obsessed with food. The preponderance of cookbooks, cooking shows, and books about food, as well as the increasing obesity epidemic, attest to this fact. But we're now more focused on the actual food rather than the experience of it. Food has become an object in itself rather than part of the larger context of the meal. This commoditization of food is part of a larger historical trend in our society of replacing experiences with goods. But more recently, as Joseph, Spine, Joseph Pine spoke about, people are revolting against this. They've begun to recognize that few goods are inherently valuable without the experience that accompanies them. He spoke on how people have begun to replace goods with experiences, and we need to continue this with food, turn food back into meals. A quick personal anecdote to illustrate the power of eating together to bring people together. In my dorm, at the beginning of the year, we ate nearly every meal together. At mealtimes, we would just go around and round up people and go en masse to eat lunch or dinner. A couple of times, we cooked at the dorm, all having a part in cooking and then eating the meal we had created. I'm sure that our current closeness as a dorm is a direct result of these meals eaten together. These people have become my surrogate family because we do what families do together, eat. So I encourage each and every one of you to, today, when you go get lunch, grab a friend. Find somebody you don't know that well and sit down with them to eat. Have a meal and really experience it. Don't just shovel food into your body. I'm a college student. I know the time constraints that we have and how it seems like there's never enough time to really eat. But trust me, it's worth it. And then this evening, do the same thing at dinner. And then again tomorrow. And when you go home for Thanksgiving, think about how eating together brings your family together. Connecting people beyond what just sitting there and watching TV does. Maybe even eat together other meals than Thanksgiving dinner. You might just be able to recapture a bit of that sense of community that is so lacking in our daily lives.